All right, I think we should um, get started. If you can all hear me tonight, um, Happy New Year first. Um, thank you so much for joining us today again at the Data Science Seminar from the University of Washington. As part of the University of Washington, we acknowledge the Coast of Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Makulshit nations. I am Nicoleta Christia uh, with the Science Institute, and today I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Shirag Shah. Dr. Shah is an associate professor of information in Information School, I School at the University of Washington in Seattle. He is also an adjunct associate professor with uh, Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering, and as well as um, Human Centered Design and Engineering at the University of Washington. He's the founding director of for Info Seeking Lab and founding co-director of Center of uh, Responsib Responsibility in AI Systems and Experience Experiences, and also known as RAISE. Uh, his research interests include intelligent search and recommender systems, trying to understand the task a person is doing and providing proactive recommendations. In addition to creating task-based systems that provide um, mere, more personalized reactive and proactive recommendations, he is also focusing on making such systems transparent, fair, and free of biases. Today, um, I welcome Dr. Um, Shah, and uh, he will be addressing the question, can large-scale information access systems be made um, fair, unbiased, and transparent. So it's really um, the focus of his research. And with that, I would like to invite Dr. Shah to the microphone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicoletta, for that introduction. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, we've been trying to have me here for almost a year now uh, for different reasons, different scheduling things, just hasn't worked out. And so this quarter, when they invited me again. I said, well, I'll take the first one available because I don't want to miss another year. So I'm really glad finally it worked out and I'm able to come here. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so happy new year, everyone. Welcome to this new year, new quarter. Um, I was actually also hoping to be in person, um, but obviously uh, the circumstances are different, but still um, uh, glad to be here. So um, what I'm going to do today is, um, um, as you can see, this is my title. This is the question. And I'll try to um, answer it. Obviously, when you put something like this as title, the, the expectation is uh, there will be some answers. Uh, but I'll have to give a disclaimer that uh, I don't have great answers. And in fact, this is one of the big problems uh, with pursuing this research that I've come across. Um, that just when you think that you figure something out, something else happens that almost nullifies or diminishes what you've just done. Um, and it's nothing wrong with what you've done. It's just that so much of what we're trying to do in this area um, is keep, it, it keeps shifting, right? Um, and, and again, it's not very surprising because a lot of these things are coming from social norms, things like bias, things like fairness. Um, and so, uh, this is a very exciting area, and so I'm glad to be talking about that. Uh, but just know that we haven't resolved all the problems. Uh, in fact, there are more problems than solutions here. And so what I hope to do with this talk is to bring up some of these problems, some of these issues. I'll also talk about some of the solutions we've tried doing, uh, but then I'll, uh, I'll be humble with you and say, well, look, this we tried, it seemed to be working, but then it kind of didn't work out. And here are the reasons. So in this talk, I'll uh, focus on information access systems, uh, more specifically search and recommender systems. Some of the problems with these systems you may already know. Um, and then think about where these problems are coming from, right? And, and this may seem like a new area, but it's not actually. This, these, are, these problems have been around for a long time. Um, and of course, we want to think about how do we address these problems? Uh, and th this is a truly interdisciplinary research area where you realize that it's not just a purely computational problem or purely data problem. Uh, there are all, all kinds of things that, uh, and all kinds of people that need to come together to address some of these. 
end, uh, and this may be the anticlimactic uh, uh, thing here, which is leaving with you with with the question rather than an answer as a conclusion. Um, that it's still difficult, even after doing uh, understanding these problems, appreciating how um, challenging, how important they are, and doing several things. There are still things that we don't understand, and there are things that are still very difficult to address. So just a quick uh, overview of uh, what are the problems? What are some of the problems with the search and recommender systems? So actually we can go back um, several decades where um, some of you may actually know this, but um, if, if you grew up mostly in 21st century, maybe this uh, you may have missed this. This is an interface for travel booking, right? And there was a time, maybe there's still time uh, at some places where travel agents who are trained to use this specialized interface can operate this and find the flights that you need, the connections and, and so on. Well, it turned out that uh, in the 90, 1990s, um, there was some sort of uh, bias that we people started seeing. And why was that? Because uh, even though one could search in the system for the source and the destinations and the time and other parameters, there were many results. And so somewhere you have to decide how to rank those things. And in that, the company that was providing the service, well, they started selling the space. So they would have airlines paying them to get those airline results come up at a higher uh, ranking. Right? And so this was one of the early cases of what's called computational bias, that an average user uh, may not know that the results that are coming to them are being organized or reorganized using some other criteria than just relevance or um, recency or price, but there may be this paid content. And th for these kind of interfaces, it wasn't clear which was paid and which were not. Um, so this was actually worked by one of our uh, professors at iSchool, uh, Batya Friedman um, and Helen Nissenbaum. Uh, all the way going in the 1990s. Uh, now, one could argue that this is not really biased because if you look at things like say grocery stores, they do this all the time uh, because they get a, they, they have a opportunity to uh, place products and they can decide some products are well-placed so they have easy access for the customers. Others are a little bit out of reach so you have to do extra work. And so of course we have examples in real world also where these kind of bias happens, whether it's a good bias, right, good, uh, right thing to do or not, all that's what uh, is up for interpretation. But these things have happened. Um, fast forward a couple of decades, and we see examples like this. Um, this was a famous example, and we'll come back to this, where if you look for CEO examples in Google image search, as you can see, you come up with mostly um, white male. Now, there are two views here. One would say, well, look, uh, if we assume gender to be binary, then there should be that other class that's almost missing here or completely missing here. Uh, the other view is, well, sure, most CEOs are actually men and most of them are white, so no surprise. But even with that notion, there should be at least some representation for other demographics because there are women CEOs and there are CEOs of different color. So you do see this kind of things. Um, and we see many other examples in search and recommender systems where um, we see the implicit biases that we have as individuals, as society, uh, get reflected in the data that we have and get reflected in the systems we use. So I already started alluding to this. Where are these things coming from? Well, first of all, um, this, this may be hard to admit, but we, we are biased people. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean we are bad people, but we all have our inbuilt biases um, that often come out in ways that we don't anticipate. Data sets can be biased. In fact, a lot of data sets, most data sets uh, have some sort of bias. Sometimes they're known biases, sometimes they're not. Any model can be biased built on these data sets. And so there are certain things that statisticians just know and, and admit, uh, we take it for granted, but 
there's no data that's a perfect representation of the underlying world. And so there is always going to be some, be some trade-offs made uh, in, in collecting, storing, representing this data and, and doing the analysis from it. So there's a lot of biases that's just inbuilt in how we operate. But then there is also biases that happen in the systems and, and the way this data and the information are processed and presented. So for instance, here's what happens typically on a Google search uh, page, the top 10 results, the, these are the click-through rates. So as you can see, and not surprising, that the top result, the first result gets clicked the most, right? And then as you go down the rank list, the, the rate drops a lot. And by the time you get to the bottom of the page, it's barely 1%, right? And most people are not even going to the second page. So what this tells us is, even when we have, let's say, right kind of data, free of biases, well, the way the data is retrieved and presented itself presents a bias, right? Because people are not looking at these results uniformly. They're looking at this in a very uh, skewed uh, way, right? So here's what an, an example of how that, why that matters. Uh, a couple of years ago, this story broke out on Facebook that apparently there is a deadly spider in some parts of uh, the US, uh, which with one bite, it can kill you. And there are people who have died. Um, this was actually a fake news, right? This was uh, misinformation, but of course people freak out and this is a sensational thing. And so if you look at the Google search logs uh, during that time, there was this spike uh, of search about deadly spiders, right? And if you look at what people are looking at, so if you take things about deadly spiders a query and get the top 100 results, and we did this analysis where here's the box with all the 100 results, and if you look at what those results were about, you find that the big portion of it, this big oval, is the sharing and discussion of that original post about the deadly spider that was on Facebook. Then there were some articles that were essentially fact checking about this. Is this really true and so on. There is uh, general articles about dangerous spiders and first aid on spider bite and use and so on. So the, that, that makes up your top 100 results. But think about what people are really looking at. The first page, the top 10 results. So the shaded region is what people are being exposed to out of those 100 results. So even though in all the 100 results in this small universe, there were articles that were refuting this uh, original story, but what people were being exposed to was mostly about that original post and the discussions around it. So if you go to Google looking for deadly spiders, you keep seeing the same kind of stories about, yes, the spider can kill you and people have died and so on, right? Uh, and so it took a while for people, the other kind of stories to start percolating and coming up and then, then people discovering. But for a while it was, you know, and so this is the effect of, um, the, the, the presentation bias that perpetuates. Um, but this shouldn't come as a surprise too, because if you think about how these big system, large scale systems are working, right? So first off, you have to understand that search is expensive to, to, to build search systems, uh, to recommend a system to run it. It's very expensive, not surprising. Um, how do we pay for it? Because the users are not paying, right? I mean, it's free, free to use. Well, we know that ads are primary ways for paying it and gen generating revenue. The question is, why would somebody place ad? Um, well, people uh, place ads where they can have enough uh, eyeballs to that uh, display, right? Think about billboard. I mean, you wouldn't put a billboard in some random place where nobody's visiting, nobody's uh, looking. Uh, you wanna put it uh, where people can see. So impressions and clicks and engagement, monthly active user, daily active user, these are the things that people look at for placing the ads. Now, how do you, if you're a service provider, your objective then becomes driving up these things so that you can have people bringing ads. Well, how would you increase engagement? Well, you wanna give people what they want kind of seems like a no-brainer. I mean, sure, why not? What's, what's wrong with that? 
So the question is, if you look at what do people want, right? Well, um, people want not just facts and information, um, they also want things that are entertaining, uh, things that are confirming to their existing biases. Um, more importantly, we've known that people have high engagement with things that are off, that are propagating hate, fear, conspiracy. Right? I mean, today we are here at the first anniversary of January 6th, the Capitol uh, uh, insurrection. And we know the effect that these things could have, the, the, the stories of hate and fear and conspiracy. So these things are not just for some personal entertainment or confirmation, but this actually people do act out based on uh, those things. But this is the kind of things that we know people want. I mean, if you look at, uh, this is kind of dated, uh, so it, it's probably not fully accurate, but, but you can relate to it, that if you're looking for NASA on YouTube, um, there are these videos that you see as recommended videos um, that are recommended a lot more than actual NASA related videos. And these videos are all misinformation. They're all some kind of conspiracy theories, but you can see that they have 11 times more um, re uh, recommendations than, than normal uh, you know, NASA related videos, seven times more, six times more and so on. So these things are recommended because these are the ones that are generating more clicks, more engagement. And when those are your driving measures for success, no wonder your algorithm learns that these are the good things to keep pushing because people are clicking on it. So they must want this, right? But we are ignoring the fact that what people want is not just the right, factual, relevant, quality information. They're also, they also want things that feed into their hate, hatred, fear, and, and conspiracy. Now, how do you address something like this? Because it's a very complex problem. This is not just fixing system. This is also kind of fixing the society. Well, there are lots of efforts people have done to addressing these kind of biases and bringing some amount of fairness. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll give one example of um, how we, we might do, right? So this is something that we've done. So what we did is say, well, let's uh, address bias by bringing more diversity. Right? So obviously there's all kinds of things. I mean, you saw that spider example in the top 100 and we're not even looking at the whole web. We're looking at just the top 100 results. Um, there are bad stuff, but there's also good stuff. Right? And so if we could bring up some amount of diversity in the top 10 results that the users see, maybe there is some chance to break out of that cycle. So what we did, is we took a little sliver of that search data. So for a given query, take the, the top 100 results. Then um, we assume that there are two different views in that or two different subtopics. So we just kind of clustered those uh, in, in those. And then we said, let's focus on the top 10 results. So how do we re-rank the top 10 results so it has more diversity, right? And, and we equated diversity with fairness. So higher the uh, diversity, higher the fairness, now, or, or lower the bias, right? Uh, and we specifically consider two forms of fairness. One is statistical parity, where we say that if there are two subgroups, each of the subgroups should have equal representation. And the other is disparate impact, which says that the, the su subgroups should have uh, exposure corresponding to their size. So a larger group gets larger exposure uh, and so on. But this work was done with my uh, former PhD student who's now at uh, Amazon, Royan. Um, we, we published uh, some papers based on that, but I'm gonna give you a very um, simple view of what we did. So here are some data. So we collect some data from Google. We collected some, uh, we had some data from New York Times. Um, and as I said, we did the clustering into two subtopics. Okay. So here's what we are trying to do. Imagine you have this top 100 results for a given topic or a query. So there are these 10 pages, each page has 10 results. And from those, we are trying to just do the top 10 results. Just, just focus on the first page. Okay. Also consider that these uh, top 100 results are, oops, are in two subgroups, red and blue, right? 
And so, and they're distributed all around this 10 pages. Um, we want to create a fair top 10 results. Now the fairness, if it is statistical parity, then you need equal blue and equal red. So this is what you can do. If you want, uh, if your notion of fairness is disparate impact, then you realize that in the top 100, there are 70 blue and 30 red. So in your top 10, you should have seven blue and three red. Right? Now, the problem here is we're not dealing with classification problem, we're dealing with the ranking problem. <clears throat> so the relative ranking of these things matter. So we can't simply stack all the blue and then all the red. Um, we have to think about their actual ranking too. So what we did, okay, well, let's, let's modify that a little. And um, we still wanna do statistical parity, which means we want equal blue and equal red, but let's preserve that relative ranking. So as we go through this top 100 results, looking for our five blue and five red, we preserve the relative ranking. And when we construct the top 10, we have those blues and red ordered in that way. So we're still getting five blues and five red, but their ranking is preserved. Similarly, if you go with disparate impact, you're looking for seven blue, three red, same idea, right? So I'm not saying one is better than the other, but it's just, I'm saying that, well, it depends on your notion of fairness. Do you think that every group should have equal or proportional, right? Well, so this is fine, but as you can see, we are still sampling. We're not diversifying as much. We're still sampling mostly from the first page, maybe a little bit from the second page. So we came up with another variation, said, okay, well, let's, uh, instead of just sampling vertically, let's sample horizontally. Okay, so what would that look like? So now for statistical parity fairness, we're looking for five blue. So we go across. We pick the first blue from each of the page until we collect the necessary you know, blues. Same, same thing with red. And then we construct the top 10 with that relative ranking. Similarly, if you're doing disparate impact, looking for seven blues, go across, got seven blues looking for three red. And once again, you construct your top 10. Yeah. So one, we are doing mostly vertical sampling. The other, we're doing horizontal sampling. Can we combine this? Can we actually explore this whole space? So that's where we um, uh, use a variation of uh, something called epsilon greedy. So this is used uh, quite widely in um, reinforcement learning and many other applications where uh, the notion is to do a combination of exploration and exploitation, right? So epsilon is typically a small value between zero and one, and that ind indicates amount of exploration, right? Um, so you explore the results with epsilon probability and exploit with one minus epsilon. So for instance, if I set epsilon to zero, which means no exploration, Right? So the, let's say I take the original Google results, epsilon zero means exactly what Google provided. You know, pure exploitation, no exploration. Epsilon one on the other hand would be, I got the top 100 results from Google and then I just randomly go around collecting, bringing the top 10 results, right? So that's full expression. But typically we wanna do something in between. So a simple algorithm would be, we set some value to epsilon, let's say epsilon 0.1, and with that probability, pick something randomly from the top 100, and then one minus epsilon, so 0.9 probability, just go down the usual rank list that Google provides. So that's a kind of a fair, uh, uh, naive epsilon greedy. Um, whereas a, a fair epsilon greedy would consider the underlying distribution of those subtopics. So what we do there is with probability epsilon, so that's our probability for exploration, that's where we randomly pick one of the clusters. So we don't do random in all the hundred, but say, okay, well, let's pick blue or red and pick the top from it. And with Epsilon of uh, probability one minus Epsilon, which is the probability for exploitation, say, let's pick the fair cluster, right? And what is fair? Well, fair could be based on statistical parity or disparate impact. So if we are going with statistical parity, we say, well, we want to make sure we have equal number of blue and red. How many red we got? Oh, we are higher on red. We need to, next, we need to find the blue, right? And so on. So we kind of balance it. So when we did this, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to bore you with numbers and, and, and stuff, but I can tell you that um, with this algorithm, 
we found that we were able to um, improve diversity, which is almost by design. If you think about it, you know, because we are imposing this process of going around uh, and selecting, it, it, it's by design. But we found that we can improve uh, diversity while also retaining good relevance, or in some cases, even improving relevance. Right? So that was kind of important. Um, but we can't just do random exploration. So randomness doesn't equate to fairness. Okay? Going back to that example of uh, spider bite. So the, on the left is what we would see originally in the Google uh, results. With Epsilon Greedy, you can see that we, we, we are not changing the universe. What we're changing is what you get to see on the top 10 results. So you can see that the shaded region has shifted. So sure, you're still seeing things that are the fake news, but you're starting to also see other things in that mix, including some fact-checking things. So if you're actually going through those 10 results, some of them will point out that this was actually fake news, that this was uh, misinformation and so on, right? So this is the hope that we're not able to change the Google algorithm. We're not able to change the universe, but if are able, if we can put a layer on 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 the the things that people get to see, and if we expose people to more diverse opinions or ideas, then there is a hope of breaking that circle. Otherwise, people keep clicking on sensational things, and the algorithms behind the scene keep learning that was a good thing to do. Let's keep recommending the same thing. So this was a this was a kind of a, a nice positive result, but we said well. Does it really matter? Do people really notice this? So we designed this little game called Google or not. And what we did there is similar to what I was showing you before, where you have the original Google top 10, and then you have the other 10, which we have modified. All right, so here's an example. So for the same query, one of this list is the original Google list, and the other one is designed using that Epsilon greedy algorithm. right? And we made it as a game where you get to pick which one you like, right? Or which one is from Google, which one. Uh, what we found is up to some limit of epsilon. And remember, epsilon means exploration. So up to some amount of exploration, up to some amount of diversity, people can't tell the difference between the original Google list and our modified. So that's good. This is kind of uh, um, similar to, you know, what my wife does, you know, feeding some, sneaking some vegetables and kids food. If they don't notice the difference, that's great. You know, we are able to give them vegetables that they usually don't like. And if they don't complain, they don't, can tell the difference, then that's great. Um, but if we increase Epsilon too much, then people start looking at the difference, right? So, so in other words, we could do, introduce some amount of diversity without resulting in, um, degradation of user uh, satisfaction up to some level. So this seems like we were very happy with this results, right? Because we showed things using the backend, the simulations, the algorithmic side, and also the user side. But we also found that the same technique can be used to introduce most mi more misinformation that people will not notice, right? And so when we did a similar experiments with uh, COVID related uh, news stories injected into some of these things through that Epsilon greedy algorithm and people can't tell the difference, well, that's a bad side effect of it, right? So the same thing, the same process that you can use to introduce some diversity and people don't notice, essentially you can use the same tool, same process to introduce misinformation and people they'll notice or, or they think this is all good, right? So um, there are all kinds of things we can do. There are things that kind of even backfire. So why is this so difficult? Because as I said, this is kind of a whack-a-mole kind of a problem where we thought we saw one thing, but then there's this side effect. Now we have to work with, deal with misinformation, right? So it's almost like, you know, you're, you're, addressing one and other thing comes up. So that's where what I've been thinking about, and, and I don't have fully resolved answers here, 
um, that this is a complex problem. I mean, we would like to make this a very technical problem where we can understand, we can solve it, we can show, uh, and, and I'm guilty of that. You know, I've done several works which, which are like that. Um, but I think there are deeper challenges here. Some of them are stemming from how we measure things. Some of them are just our cognitive issues. Some are philosophical. So what I mean by that, so here's an example of uh, what happened with Facebook uh, news uh, leading to the 2020 elections, uh, sorry, 2016 elections, my bad. So the days leading to that election day, the black line indicates the engagement with the mainstream news. So this is the top 20 election stories on Facebook. So you can see the engagement with the, the the reliable mainstream news that's been vetted by, reported by qualified journalists uh, decline. Whereas the fake news, things that are, and these are manually labeled, so we know um, the engagement with those stories kept increasing. And by the election day, you can see the reverse trend, right? Uh, of course, we've seen um, even more recently that the false and misleading news about COVID-19 they've been shown to have 140 times more engagement than things coming out of uh, reliable sources like CDC and WHO. So we just are a lot more engaged with conspiracy theories, misinformation than, than other things. And this is a problem. This is a measurement problem because if you think about in grad school, when we are building this search system, recommended system, we, we learn about this technical um, uh, measurements, right? How do you measure relevance and utility and novelty and so on? Uh, but in reality, when you're building these systems, and because remember, you need to support this system, you you know, you need to earn revenue. Well, those impressions, engagement, those kind of things end up becoming more important, and those are business metric, right? And then, of course, there are all the social measurements that we don't even know quite well how to do things like diversity and fairness. Right. So when it comes to really running these systems and having these systems serve large population with all kinds of agenda, um, the measurement that we often learn in this, and I also teach these things in technical sense, are often overshadowed by social and business objectives. Then there are cognitive issues. So as I said before, when we look at search results, um, there's this notion of, oh, what I see at the top is the, the best. That's the most relevant, right? And to some extent, that's true, right? Because that's how the algorithms are supposed to work. But the algorithms, as we know, are not simply based on relevance. They're based on all kinds of signals, including the signal of engagement. What are people clicking on most, right? And so that also goes into that. So it perpetuates the thing, the way we think about information being presented to us and how we, might, how we believe in it it perpetuates back to the uh, algorithms and so on, right? We often hear from people saying, um, because they saw it on Google, it must be true. Or because they couldn't find it on Google, it must not exist. So there is this blind trust with these systems uh, and its ranking that perpetuates this, this bias. And then there are all kinds of philosophical issues with this, right? Uh, most recently, we've been looking at this foundation, what's called foundation models or large language models. And many um, scholars have also pointed out that uh, as we are building these systems using a, a few uh, of these pre-trained models or large language models or foundation models, a number of ways you can talk about it, that they are creating this algorithmic monoculture, that there's one way to represent the world. And then all these applications are built using this few uh, pre-built, pre-trained models that a few uh, tech companies in the world gets to control, right? So do we really want that? Is that even the right thing to do, right? Uh, so I have some uh, collaboration with Emily Bender from um, Linguistics Department um, on, on this very idea of, is this even the right thing? Is this what we really want to do? Or we, there are a few models, pre-trained models in the world that are driving all this AI applications, all this uh, information access applications, uh, and we blindly believe in those, right? So, so again, there are philosophical issues that we need to uh, cope with. What do we do about this? 
So now finally, I'm going to talk about some potential solutions. Not all of them are from my group. So because of course, there are a lot of people doing incredible amount of work here uh, in a lot of you know, things uh, they have achieved. Um, and so one of the ways we can maybe start addressing this as, as we're building this machine learning models, let's be very transparent because a lot of the problems have happened because we are not understanding enough about the, these data sets we are using for building our systems or these pre-trained models like the large language models we're using for, uh, for training our models. And so one idea that Meg, Michelle and others have come up with is this, this nutrition label style uh, card, right? So here's an example where you disclose these things. Now, how are you building this model? What are the underlying characteristics of the data that you're using? And so when you declare this, it kind of becomes, again, this is similar to the nutrition labels that we see on all the food products we buy, that it's right there, it's in a transparent form, it's comparable, you can actually be informed um, and, and educated and you can make an informed decision. So that's one way to, to really be um, transparent about it. Speaking of that uh, transparency, Another way to uh, start making some real difference is um, having some advocacy and education. So I'm, I'm putting a plug for, again, Bacha Friedman and Dave Henry, which many of you hopefully know, and their book on value sensitive design. So this is something that I'm actually, I've been using quite a lot lately as I think about um, what's, what's uh, when we think about, you know, things even like data science for social good, which many of, you here are familiar with or AI for social good. Well, how do we think about social good? How do we incorporate that into AI systems? And um, for my interest, you know, search recommender systems, right? So a lot of these issues of trust and um, authoritiveness, uh, we think about that they're, they're kind of muddied up, right? You know, the way people believe in Google or Facebook or Amazon, right? There are issues with that. And so how do we rebuild some of that trust and some of that, uh, you know, redefine some of those values. So I think that's, again, uh, it comes under the education advocacy. And then there is auditing. So thinking about finding issues with this, with the systems, pointing out where the issues are, where they're coming from, perhaps that can help us uh, uh, resolve those issues. So one common technique is adversarial attack. So I'll give you a quick example of that. So back to that uh, CEO query, what I showed you before was actually a screenshot from three years ago. Now, if you go to Google and search for CEO, you will see something like this. So, and, and you can kind of see the difference, right? Before I showed you the pictures of all white men, and now you can see diversity, right? You can see women, you can see people of color. But if you look carefully, the those that are not white men are actually coming out of their stock images they're not really real people so so it seems on the surface google have fixed fixed this problem that now it's not so biased towards one kind of demographic but if you look carefully they haven't really and so how do we prove this how do we show this and it's a very simple way to do that is you do what's called adversarial attack so can i present a modification or slightly different query like CEO in the United States. And when you do that, you realize that yes, right? You know, once again, you start getting what you're getting before. Uh, so if you do something like CEO in UK, right? So it seems on the surface, Google has fixed just that one example of CEO. And then Google has, and many others have done similar things. They would just go and fix things on the surface. It may, so because, you know, it looks like it's working, but then it's very easy to break it. So what we did, we did similar things with many other professions, not just CEO. And we found that um, there is a disparity with what the real uh, distribution is. So for CEO, for instance, in the Fortune 500, how many is there are, I wanna say eight to 10% are women, right? But uh, when you look at the search results, forget about 50-50, you don't even see that eight to 10% portion of women CEOs in the top top few results, right? Um, and so if you look at the difference, and we did this with four different search engines, Google, Naver, Baidu, and Yandex. Um, 
And you can see for different professions, you find underrepresentation or overrepresentation for uh, male, uh, female gender. Now, again, I have to put a disclaimer here that we're treating gender as a binary thing here um, and acknowledging that it's, of course, uh, not all this you know, should be considered binary. But for this work, we're looking at gender, uh, assuming gender is binary construct. Uh, and you can see that there are disparities and in some cases, really big disparity in terms of representation for certain gender. And so this is a way, this is a kind of auditing the system to show that no, you know, you haven't really fixed the problem. There, there is an uh, inherent problem. How do we fix it? So that's where we said, okay, well, let's bring in um, what we know, oops, um, with that fairness idea, right? And so um, again, you know, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of details here, how we did it. Uh, we actually have a triple AI paper coming up uh, on, on this work where you see this 10 different professions in the US and then the first column shows the amount of bias. And this is measured using some equation that I'm not putting here, but essentially it's the bias. It's a disparity between what you see the representation in the images about those genders um, and what the real distribution is coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, for that profession in the US, right? Um, and, and so that's sort of the, the, the difference. Uh, and that's what we're calling the bias here. And when we use our epsilon greedy algorithm or, or uh, this what's called relevance aware swapping, uh, which is a variation of it, uh, we can show that in cases where there is a higher bias, we could actually bring that bias down using our techniques, right? And then we also propose, uh, so, so this is the epsilon greedy, but the fair greedy, which, which I described before, it usually achieves the best result uh, along. So the lower is better, right? So this, these are the numbers for amount of bias and amount of bias with respect to what the representation is with what the actual distribution of the, the genders, uh, uh, genders are in those professions. So you can see that our algorithm gets the lowest scores, lowest uh, numbers for bias. Uh, and the last column is, is we're comparing with another uh, state of the art. And, and so you know, we're doing, uh, for these 10 professions, doing great on, on, on almost all of them. So, so again, there are ways to do this, uh, address this systematically. What Google did, they kind of on the surface, they did something to make it look like they have solved the problem, but they haven't systematically fixed it. And what this work shows is there is actually a way to systematically fix it, uh, you know, through different formulations. But that being said, um, what we did, it's, it's not always feasible. So what we're trying to do in, in this case, assuming that gender is binary, we're looking at, and, and before the example I gave was one topic, two subtopics. Well, that's a very simple characterization of the complex you know, topic or, or gender or race or whatever you have. So trying to do optimization across multiple dimensions, it's, it's, it's often very hard and not even well-defined, right? Um, if you are looking at this, so what we did, we did re-ranking. So there was an original ranking and then we changed that to bring up this. Well, there's a cost associated with doing this re-ranking. So that's not always feasible. That's not always, you know. And then there is a social uh, issue because we made certain assumptions about what is fair here, whether it's statistical parity or disparate impact. Um, but our own notions, our society's notions of what is fair keep changing, right? And so uh, we have to really take that into consideration that yes, as computer scientists, we would like to just pin it down to a certain formulation and go ahead and optimize around that. But um, it may turn out, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will say, you can never really, ever have a notion like right notion of fairness just because it's just you know theoretically impossible right so um so there are lots of ongoing efforts as i'll, I'll put a plug for a raise if you're not aware of it please know that this is a uw-wide effort on responsibility and ai systems and experiences um we meet every week starting tomorrow so we are meeting every friday 9 to 10 a.m on zoom if you're interested, please find out more. Um, we, it's open. We, we have participants, not just from UW, but even outside of UW, also from industry and so on. So if you're interested in this space, whether it's bias, fairness, explainability, 
all of these, these are some of my projects that I won't go into details for, uh, but I'm just putting a plug for Ray's. Um, please find out more. Uh, We'd love to have you join. So a quick summary. Um, these large scale systems, and I keep saying large scale because of course there are other systems that are not at large scale and maybe they have luxury of not having to worry about um, getting the ad revenues or impressions or engagement. Um, and maybe they have lower costs so they can afford to, you know, not, not worry about all this user engagement. But this large scale search, search and recommend system, they have issues of uh, uh, bias and unfairness and, and lack of transparency. Some of them are technical problems. Some of them are business uh, problems. Some of them are just social issues. Right? So again, we would like to have all of this technical issues so we know how to handle it, but we find over and over again that it's not as simple as just coming up with yet another algorithm, yet another formulation, and just show this fix. Because as I've admitted even in, in my work, that solving one problem sometimes bring, brings up another problem. Right? And so we have to be mindful of these larger issues. There are ways we can address, start addressing them. We can audit them. We can create education, awareness, advocacy. Now, all of these are needed, right? But it's not enough, at least in my experience so far. So really, this is where I'm going to leave you with this question to think about, right? What else could, should we do, right? That this is, this is larger than just one discipline. This is larger than just one kind of research agenda. And so if you're interested in these questions, I would love to hear from you. I would love to engage you and because you will bring a different perspective than what I know. Um, and so please welcome, I welcome your comments, questions. We have hopefully some uh, time right now, um, but if you, um, if you wouldn't mind, you know, contact me some other times and certainly joining Ray's, join, see, find out what other people are thinking, what, what, what are some interesting ideas in this space. Uh, and if you're a student, if you're interested in projects, we have a wonderful set of faculty who are doing even more incredible work than what I described here. Uh, so find out more about them. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And hopefully we can take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Shah. That was wonderful. And I'm always fascinated to hear more about these algorithms because we are interfacing with them every single day which is kind of scary. And I, I actually, I was curious about this. Um, I was very intrigued by your um, mentioning of biases versus fakes and fake news in, in particular, and how these could just get into the top 10 if, if we are not paying attention. And um, I think I'm not really a, 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 an avid Facebook user, but I think I noticed something that sometimes with a piece of news it comes it could come with a label like mm -hmm. potentially coming from an um uncertain source or like our labeling is labeling a way to you know provide extra piece of information to the user or just in the top 10 some some warning or <laughs> something that, that can help the user navigate through these uncertainties. Yeah, absolutely. So th that's definitely one of the ways to address this. Um, so, I mean, I talked about an you know, awareness or education, right? So that's part of it. And education or awareness can happen in bite size. It doesn't need to be through a lecture or through taking class, right? It could be just, um, you know, that warning sign as, as you were saying. Um, Unfortunately, uh, there are a couple of big problems with it. One is they're not always as effective because uh, you know we often know that people are not even reading the full blurb before they decide to like or share, right? And so they are just like going with the sensational headline and and often ignoring those other things. So um, now Twitter has started doing something extra, which is if you share without clicking on it, if you're without reading. Then it will give you a little that extra step. Are you sure you want to do this? Because you haven't even really gone through this, right? And so th there is a little bit more than what Facebook is doing. The other big problem with this is um, it often is presented as the best or the only approach that these uh, um, companies can do, 
right? And so they're kind of taking the shift from the way they're trying to optimize their engagement and their revenue and, and, and so on to just say, oh, we're doing all these things to ban these sources and put these labels and, and as if that's the only thing they're responsible for doing. And so that's a bigger problem for me that they're taking the attention away from where they really need to be paying, right? And, and this is where Frances Haugen, when she was testifying, she was also saying that the way these algorithms are optimized are around the engagement. So they, it is not in their best interest for you to leave. It is in their best interest for you to keep clicking on. So that's where I think they can make a real difference if they wanted to. But then they're taking the attention away to like blaming these bad actors and, and saying that our efforts are focused on finding these bad actors and labeling them. Um, so I think, you know, it's, I have a lot of things to say about Section 230 also, which is also, again, you know, it's the right thing to do, good thing to do, but then also often it takes attention away from where the real impact can be made. Um, so yes, it should be done, but we should not ignore, we should not forget that the bigger problems are still not just that. Can I, uh, so there's, I see there's a question in the Q&A, can I just quickly answer that? I think that's... Oh, absolutely. It's a um, clarification question. Um, I think the question is, uh, what does a red and blue groups signify in one of your plots? Yeah, so those are, that, that was just a hypothetical, uh, you know, what I was showing the visualization was simply just a hypothetical. Imagine if you have somehow two groups. The interesting thing is you get to define what those groups are, right? So in one example uh, that I gave the web search, uh, the, the two groups were two subtopics. Right? Um, and, and so that's how we did it. The other example I gave the image search, the two groups were gender classification, right? Um, but it could be anything and it, they don't need to be two, right? So this is one of the limitations, as I said, that we consider two subtopics, but what if there are five subtopics? Who knows how many subtopics? Uh, we consider two uh, gender labels, but what if there are five gender labels or, you know, or we shouldn't even have gender labels, right? So, I mean, I think those things that I acknowledge, but I've, uh, I've, I've you know, not addressed them in these examples. But yeah, the blue and red could be any group. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, please use the Q&A button to ask questions. I guess I could ask one more question. In um, How do these algorithms make their way into the company, <laughs> you know, uh, policies or like really uh, the you know, use in fact yeah so again um the the when it comes to ranking the intention the objective is to um provide the relevant information right but if you look at things like page rank which is google's proprietary thing but we know enough about it to know that it considers dozens of signals um what users are, this is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy if you almost, right, where they are essentially predicting what you're likely to click, mm -hmm. right? So they're going to present something at top number one that you're most likely to click. So essentially with each of the results, there is this likelihood uh, associated, right? And they're being sorted by that likelihood. The thing that you're most likely to click is at rank one, except that what you're most likely to click is not always the most right, most relevant, most authoritative thing, right? Um, and so the algorithm is blind to this, right? It doesn't differentiate between you clicking because it was the right thing to click or you clicking because it was the most entertaining thing, right? Mm -hmm. All it says is your likelihood of click. So, so no, no wonder it gets tuned to optimizing that likelihood. And it's in that best interest, the company's best interest, because you know that that means you're going to have the perception that oh, I'm getting what I'm looking for, right? I'm going to go back to this. This is such a great service, um, and and that gives them more visitations, more engagement, more monthly active users, and so on. So there's this feedback loop mm -hmm. where, in a way, they're giving you what you want, 
right? They could argue that they're not doing anything wrong. They're not giving you, you know, wrong information, not bad things that you're not, but it's sort of like, we're not really going at the heart of the problem that understand what people want or people like to click on is not always, you know, the, the right thing. And in fact, we know that people tend to engage more with conspiracy theories and yeah. messages of fear and hatred. Um, <laughs> there's a question I'm reading on the chat. Um, uh, optimistic, the spread of misinformation, especially social media will be less in the future. Um, so this is mostly the responsibility of the user platform of the government. So um, um, I think in terms of the responsibility, so all of the above, uh, I do believe, and this is how my approach has been, that there are things we can do on the technical side, the things that Facebook, Google, whatever these companies, they need to do, but that's not going to be enough. Um, we also need the, the users to do uh, their part. And in many cases, these two parties are not going to be enough and there's need to be regulation. So the, the example that I often give is smoking, right? I mean, if you think about de a few decades ago, uh, smoking and tobacco was not only um, widespread, it was actually even considered a healthy thing to do. So from those days, you know, from the, I want to say nine, early 50s or mid 50s to now, it's about whatever, you know, 50, 60 years that it took, um, that transition has happened through many, many steps, right? Uh, first, we had to establish that smoking is actually bad for you, right? So there was science that had to see the day of light of the day because a lot of those signs, a lot of the studies were done by the tobacco companies so that we had to disassociate that. So the ethical thing to do is to actually have that science done the science way and, and inform people. You have to educate people, you have to, and so there are all these campaigns run, you know, from radios to TVs to educate people, hey, smoking is actually bad for you. It can cause lung cancer and so on. You start putting warning signs on the packs of cigarette. So that's, uh, this could kill you. You can still buy it, but now you're seeing that right in front of you. Every time you open that box, you can see that sign. Yeah, we taxed it a lot. So it's expensive to buy those cigarettes, right? So again, you think about like, do I really wanna spend this much money on a pack of cigarettes or I can buy a meal? So there are regulations, there's user education, there's a social acceptance, right? So most restaurant and indoor places, they start banning smoking. So now if you're a smoker, you don't have many places where you can socially smoke. So I think it has taken all of these efforts to get to this place from where we were a few decades ago that everybody was smoking and smoking was considered good, healthy, to this place where most people don't smoke and it's not considered socially acceptable thing in most places. So I think, yeah, and this is how I see um, this going forward, that it's not gonna happen through just regulation or just user education or just tech companies fixing something. We need all of this. Well, great, thank, thank you, you so asking. much. I don't see any other questions and um, I would like to thank you again for your participation in our seminar series and I wish you all happy new year again and we'll see you next time. Thank you so thank much. Thank you all. Have a good night. Good night.